for a second. I want to give two, two opportunities as we open up this time of hearing from the Word of God. Uh, I don't know if opportunities is the right thing, right way to say it, but I want to I ask you to do two things. The first thing is for you. The second thing is for our church. So the first thing, if you don't mind bowing your heads for me, before we open up the Word of God, I want to ask that we repent. I don't know about you, but my life is messed up compared to the righteousness and holiness of God. So I need to repent every single day. So I wanna ask that you take time to position your heart before the Lord and tell him, I know I screwed up God, but I thank you for your mercy and grace. The second thing I wanna do is for our church. You know, we just sang that song, I Exalt Thee. And I don't think we can sing songs, our God reigns, I exalt thee. And we sing these things, but sometimes in life we forget those words and we let our personal opinions go above the structure and leadership of the Lord. But if we exalt him, it's his way and not our way. And so as we go into the word of God, I just want to tell you something. We got a spicy message coming. And I wanna ask that you do me a favor, that you put your hand on your neighbor. And if you're too far away, it's okay, whatever. Put your hands out, however you wanna do it. And I wanna ask that you pray a prayer of unity in your heart. Here's the two things. I wanna ask that you pray for your neighbor and they're gonna be praying for you, that we will not be divided because of what we're gonna talk about here today. That no matter what, we stand on one truth, and it is that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if that is the truth, then he unifies us all together. We might have different personal opinions, but those personal opinions do not divide the unity within the body of Christ. So would you take a second and in your heart, pray for your neighbor that we all together would be unified to hear from the Holy Spirit and surrender to whatever he says to you this morning. Lord Jesus, we proclaim the truth this morning that we just sang. You reign. For all things are yours, Lord Jesus. For your kingdom is eternal. Father God, I pray for those who have come before you with a repentant heart. Lord, will you pour your compassion, mercy, and grace upon them Will you allow them to know, Lord Jesus, that the mistakes and sins that we commit do not define who we are? That the blood of Jesus, his death and resurrection defines who we are if we have faith in him. Lord, I also pray for our church during this time, Lord, that as we hear these truths, no matter how difficult some of them are, hard to hear, and even though sometimes we might not agree with even what's in the Word of God, may we surrender to the ultimate truth and authority, which is the Word of God. So will you unite our church together, Father God? Allow us to love one another, respect one another, honor one another, and may we all come with humble ears and humble hearts before you. You are King. You receive all the glory, Lord Jesus. May it not be for man to be glorified but for the Savior of the world. Our eyes and hearts are focused on you, Lord Jesus. Receive our worship, we pray. It's in your holy name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Um, Before I dive in, actually, before I do anything, can we give it up for our incredible band? Man. Y'all about had me like David when he starts ripping off his shirts when y'all went into Our God Reigns, into uh, what was that one? What a beautiful name. Good Lord. I heard Eric go, woo. (laughs) I heard you do. Man, that was fire. Um, 
fire because it's pointed in one direction, vertically, not horizontally. So praise the Lord. Um, before we jump into what I do wanna talk about today, I wanna remind you that today is our first fruit Sunday, which means, as you know, if you've been here, we've been doing a campaign, it's called Legacy Campaign. Last week we had Commitment Sunday where you brought your commitments to the Lord of what you are pledging over the next three years. Well, today is called First Fruit Sunday where we ask for the first gift towards your pledge. Uh, after today, if you did give a commitment, after today, it's kind of up to you how you would like to uh, give, whether it's one time or if it's multiple times over three years, that's up to you. But we wanted to, as the church, uh, kind of come together in unity and give towards this campaign. So let me tell you how we're gonna do this. Uh, we wanna focus on Christ today and worship him. And so we just wanna ask, I know mo a lot of you guys have already done this online through setting up recurring donations and giving your first fruits online. So we didn't wanna do it as we all come forward. So what we're gonna ask that as you leave, uh, you can place it in the offering baskets or if you would like to do your first fruits online, that's perfectly fine too. But that's how we wanted to do it today because again, it's not for the church, it's for the Lord. And the Lord sees your giving. Right? We don't necessarily always have to make a big deal about it uh, because we want you to honor the Lord uh, in what you do. And so at the end, um, if you do wanna give your first fruits offering, you can place it in the offering baskets or again online. Everybody okay with that? This morning, I wanna take a break from our study in Acts uh, and I wanna talk about, just, just gonna be one week, and I wanna talk about this important time in our nation that we all know is coming up on Tuesday. And I wanna speak to you about the upcoming election, but more specifically, there's really two things I wanna talk to you about. Number one, the biblical view of voting, and the second thing is, what is our role as Christians in politics? All right, so that's what we're talking about. So here's, here's what I'll ask. There's a couple things I wanna ask. Number one, that you be respectful of your neighbor. You be respectful of the Lord. Uh, I, I wanna ask that you do not take this opportunity, whether you disagree or agree with me, to make this about you and your voice being heard to our church, all right? It's not about you, it's about the Lord. So this is not the opportunity, this is not the time for you to make a stance uh, in, a, in a particular way. Uh, I just wanna get that clear. I'll say this too, there might be things that I say that might, you might not agree with that might make you frustrated, but I will say this, whatever I'm gonna say, I truly believe is the truth of God's word, and so, you might not agree with it, but I'm sorry, what I'm gonna talk about we find in scripture, or at least it's backed up in scripture. So my prayer in this, as, we, as I was at preparing a lot, I listened to a lot of pastors on this, and just to be real with you, I use some of their content, and I'm not gonna name drop because I think sometimes we get distracted by pastors and shut off what I'm saying if you don't agree with that pastor, but I will say, I listened to multiple pastors who are wiser than me in this, and I agreed with what they said, so a lot of some of the things I'm gonna say actually comes from them. Uh, so as I was preparing for this, I did want to take my personal opinion out and again, base what I'm saying off of scripture. But what I was proud to say is my personal opinion aligned with scripture. And you'll see what I'm talking about here in a second. So those are the first couple things I want to, to say about this. Um, last thing is if you're visiting our church, listen, we don't talk about politics a lot. We don't. Uh, matter of fact, this is the first time I've ever preached a message on politics. And so we have one goal in this church and it's to glorify Jesus Christ. However, this is an important time in our nation. And I think what we do with our vote can glorify Jesus Christ. And so that's what I want to talk about. So getting into this, I know there's a lot of people too that would say that the church and politics don't miss, mix. That church and pastors should, should avoid politics and stay away from commenting on political leaders and their ideas of political leaders, but just to get that out of the way too, I want you to know that that concept is completely unbiblical. All throughout scripture, we see that the Bible deals with stories and individual characters that dealt with political issues in their time. And just to give you a few, Moses, Daniel, Esther, Nehemiah, John the Baptist, among others, dealt with political issues. The Bible tells us in Revelation that we will have a political leader that comes and reigns in Jerusalem on the throne for a thousand years. Who's that person? Jesus Christ. So polit politics and church do mix. W we do need to talk about these things. We cannot think that church and pastors should avoid addressing government and governmental issues. Because if they talk about them, if they dealt with them in scripture, then I'm just gonna be honest with you, history repeats itself a lot. And so since these Bible characters, including our Lord and Savior Jesus, dealt with political things, we will too. So that's why today what I wanna talk about is what is our role as Christians in the political area? 
Again, before we start, I gotta give a thing. Our church is not going to become a stage for political discussion, nor is it going to be a place where we endorse a a particular candidate. I want you to know that. It is not my role or job to tell you who to vote for. Our mission is to only give glory to King Jesus alone, okay? With that being said though, I do think that as pastors, including myself, we have a responsibility to equip people through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit with truths in important areas of our lives. And again, as we know, this is one of those important areas. And here's what we can see, and you can see this clearly in culture. If the church doesn't disciple people, then the world will. And what's happening here is if godly leaders and godly pastors go silent or refuse to be clear on issues related to politics, then the only voices that are going to be speaking are godless voices. And a lot of times, those godless voices persuade godly people to put morals and values aside and fall in line with their thinking and ideologies. So, if we are not equipped with the truth, what we're gonna find, and we've already seen it, as including Christians, will just follow the next trend or shiny thing or smooth talking person who is godless in their life. Another reason I'm speaking about this is because we have seen politics move into spiritual issues. Churches, maybe not necessarily ours, but I'll say that we have faults in our churches, but churches in America and across the world in general, I think have not done a great job speaking out around the spiritual issues that politics are moving into. We're not speaking out and equipping people to stand firm on their values. And here's just what I mean. You can see this again in our government. Over the past 15 to 20 years, the government has moved from just typical things that we should deal with in government to things like redefining marriage, erasing genders, reframing abortion as reproductive rights, and then using our school system to indoctrinate our kids to accept it. Listen, all of those things I just mentioned are spiritual issues, and they're spiritual issues because the Word of God addresses them. It is not the role of a government to redefine spiritual issues. It's the role of the church to, with truth, respect, and love, teach on spiritual issues and frame our government around it. You follow? So we have a big problem on our hands. And it's not the church moving into politics. It's politics moving into the church. So it is time for us as believers in Christ to say enough is enough we stand firm on our values and beliefs. We stand firm on the word of God. So as I said, I'm not here to tell you who to vote for. My goal is to help us understand we have a responsibility. And it's also to help you understand that you have a role in the political area. I wanna teach the truth of scripture and ask the Holy Spirit to lead you who you should vote for. I'm also well aware because we've had a lot of early voting that a lot of you have already voted. But if you have not, this message is for you, right? And maybe it's for the next election. Um, I bring this up, the the first question I wanna talk about today is, as a Christian, should we vote? And I bring this up because a study was done in 2020 that there was approximately 30 million followers of Jesus that did not vote in the 2020 election. And I'll be honest, I understand their reasoning on a, how do I say this? Because I don't wanna offend anybody, but I'm sorry, the truth is the truth. I understand your reasoning on an immature level because their reasoning is, I don't care for either candidate. They saw in 2020 and much like today, two evils, so they did not want to vote because their vote looked like they agreed with everything that one particular person stood for. So I understand that it's hard to vote for someone that doesn't fit everything that you agree with. However, I will say this, and I'm gonna get into this a little deeper. I also think that's an immature way to think about this. I think much like this year, uh, I don't know what your views are, but personally, I don't like either of these two candidates to be the ones who represents the country I love. However, it is who we have to represent the country that I love. 
And so the question on should we vote, I wanna show you to answer this, a biblical truth that we see in scripture. I'm gonna use verses, individual verses to back up my points here. As y'all know, I talked about this last, last week. I'm more of a open up the word and go verse by verse. And so topical uh, preaching is not my strength because I, I don't like to necessarily pull individual verses out with giving full context. But I will say, these verses I'm using do back up my points, but I'm not going through an entire passage uh, to, to, to get my point across here today or to teach the, the word of God. But to, to emphasize my point or to prove my point of why I do believe that we as Christians should vote, I wanna show you a biblical truth. In scripture, we see that God established three institutions. There might be others, but for today, three main institutions. Number one, he established the family. That was in the book of Genesis, Genesis two to be exact. Number two, God established the church. We see this in the book that we're studying currently, the book of Acts. And number three, the Bible also teaches that God established the government. Now, families in church, we get that, we can go in line with that. Government is where we kind of fall away from, well, does the Bible really say that God established the government? It doesn't necessarily say in Habakkuk 1.3, God established the government. However, Paul did speak on this in Romans 13.1. Look at what Paul says. He says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no, no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Another version says, established by God. So in that verse, we can see that yes, God did take part in, in his created order, put the government in place to rule, if you will. I know we don't like that word, but to govern or rule over groups of people. We also see here that every person, that we should all be subject to every government authority because no one in authority is just put there with, without God being in control of that. Now I wanna speak on this for a second. God is in control of whoever is in authority. However, that does not mean that God hand plucked this person and put him in authority. Now let me, let me show you what I mean by this. We all have a right to vote in our country to vote for the person we put in political leadership, right? So. God gave us that freedom and that right just in America and other countries. But in America, we have the freedom to vote. So if the nation puts in someone you don't agree with, they voted to put that person in place. So God did not make it happen, although he does control all things. So he allowed it to happen. And so sometimes we wonder, why would God allow such a terrible leader to be over a great nation like America? Well, again, think from a 10,000 foot view and not just in your earthly minded, uh, yearly, yearly or daily mind. Even though God might not have wanted that person in place, he allowed it to happen because what we don't understand, sometimes God uses bad things to bring people to repentance in him. Sometimes through the negativity on earth, people see what it looks like to be godless or be separated from God and it draws them to him. So we can just know that although maybe God didn't say, I want this person in government, he gave us the freedom to elect that person. And since he's in control, he can use whoever to draw people to himself, okay? So what I wanna say is everybody take a step back from the ledge and breathe a little bit. Breathe. I understand how important it is to vote and elect a godly leader, but sometimes that doesn't happen. And frankly, over the past four years, it hasn't happened. But God is still in control and he's still working for the good of who? Those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So trust in the, fi the finished work of Jesus on the cross and live your responsibility to reflect the heart and character of Jesus on this earth, okay? Going back to this verse, I want us to think about this. It says, be subject to governing authorities. And then it says, all that exists have been instituted or established by God. Going back to my point. When Paul was writing this, the governmental structure was different than it is now. But that concept is still there, right? So it was a different way they went about it. But again, the concept is still there. We submit to the governing authorities because they're all put in place by God. Again, we've been blessed to live in a country where we get a say in this. God is sovereign. And in our nation, he has allowed the people free will to select who the leader is. But we need to understand these things on a biblical, letter too, biblical level. Whatever the Lord creates, Satan tries to capture. So taking these three institutions as an example, 
In Genesis 2, when God established the family, what did we see Satan do through the word of God? God established the family, so Satan in his evil ways tried to capture God's creation. And what we saw take place is Adam, who was weak and passive husband, stood by and Satan stepped forward. So Satan led Adam's wife into sinning instead of Adam leading his wife into righteousness. So we stepped back, Satan moved in. So just a side note, what can we take away from just that one point in the family? Well, let me tell you. Husbands, if you don't lead your family, Satan will. Side note. What about number two, the establishment of the church? All right, what we saw that the, the Lord instituted the church, we're seeing that in the book of Acts. But what we also saw in Revelation 2 and 3, that there were churches with passive weak pastors Instead of calling their church to repent of sin, they tolerated sin and it resulted in those churches uh, where Satan stepped forward and started leading these churches into more sin. That's why we see in Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9, Jesus calls two out of the seven churches a synagogue of Satan. So if we don't step forward and teaching truth of the gospel, then Satan will try to steal what God created and he will infiltrate the church and lead them into tolerating sin. And please tell me that you see this in America and across the world right now. This is that movement of a watered down gospel where they want just enough to tell you the truth without the hard truth of what the Lord really calls you to do is sacrifice your life and carry your cross daily. Satan will try to redefine what God created. Those are the first two examples. So if they're in the family and they're in their church, well, we can guarantee that it's also in the third establishment. Look at the pattern. It's also in the government. So if godly people won't lead their nation by voting, then godless people will. And what scripture warns us about in Proverbs 29, 2, it says, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. Well, again, another version says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, people groan. This is a biblical warning for who we place in leadership over our nation. So what if God is using his disciples, me and you, through our vote to bring about his morals, values, and ideas? So does your vote matter? Absolutely, it does. Next thing I wanna talk about. Since your vote matters, what do you do when either candidate doesn't fit all of your desires? What do you do when either candidate isn't a perfect option? Let me be honest with you. I wanna shoot straight as I always do, whether it's on politi po political issues or just, just the, the word of God. I understand those who say, I don't agree with either con uh, inner candidate because they're crazy, they're quote racist, they're flawed or whatever. And that's any election year, I get that. But that does not mean that you should sit out and not vote because it doesn't fit 100% of your wants or 100% of your desires, or you don't prefer their personality. Uh, just think about this in life, not, not even a political issue, just think about in life. How many decisions do you make that fit what you want 100% of the time? Like if you make a decision, it is 100% what I want. Very rarely is something perfect when you make that decision. And being honest, just because Jesus isn't on the ballot, so your choice for president is not gonna be 100% perfect either. Just being real. So when a mature Christian is voting, we can't just look at our wants or the candidate's personality, but what we need to do is look at the most important thing. We look at what? Their policies, not their personalities, but their policies. We see in 1 Samuel 16, 7, Israel was searching for a new king after King Saul. And they were looking at all these different men, men who were tall, who were, who were good looking, who were strong, who fit the type physically of a king. But here's what the Lord said to Samuel. He says, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature. Why? Because I, the Lord, have rejected him, meaning he is not the one I want for king over Israel. For the Lord sees not as man sees, for man looks at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. If we want to follow the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we have to take 
personality or physical appearance out of it, whether it's black, white, man, or female, take personal opinion out of it because the most important thing is that we look deep on the inside rather than on the superficial things on the outside. When dealing with things that affect our nation, we must vote on policies rather than likability. So again, you might not agree with what I'm saying, but I'm sorry, the truth is the truth. Don't vote for who you like the most, vote for who will lead our nation the best. And I know that's hard. It's hard for some of us to agree with, but again, let me show you in scripture what happens because there are, again, this is a category, so it might not fit perfectly in line all through scripture, but we do see in, the mo- in most parts that there's three categories of leaders in scripture. Right? So number one are three types of leaders. Number one, you have righteous leaders where the Bible literally says he's a righteous leader. This is a person who promotes and celebrates righteous things. And what are righteous things? It's the things of God. Their heart is correct. Their posture towards the Lord is correct. They surrender to the Lord's will and they lead with humility in honor of their, of their nation. That's a righteous leader. One example of a righteous leader is King Josiah. Um, if you don't know the story or not familiar about King Josiah, you can read about him in 2 Kings, 2 Kings 22 to be exact. But King Josiah, when he became king, was only eight years old. Side note, my son is nine years old. Can you imagine a nine-year-old being over? But you know what's crazy about this? Oh, it was run way smoother with a nine-year-old than it is right now. Hey, and I'm, again, I'm not pointing out just this four years. Just being honest, we got to look at both sides here. But a nine-year-old or eight-year-old ran the nation better. You know why? Because his heart was surrendered to the Lord. And what happened is when King Josiah became president, a few, uh, president, king, <laughs> a few years after that, basically in a closet of, a, of the temple, he found the law of God. He found the Bible. And what we read through this is, he starts to read scripture, this young boy. At this point, he was probably more of a teenager, 12 to 13, 14 years old. But he starts to read what he found, this Bible that was forgotten over the whole nation of Israel, completely forgot about the law of God. So he reads it and he finds it. And what happens is when you read the living word of God, the Holy Spirit fills you with life, right? So that's exactly what happened. And that's true for us today, side note. That's why it's important to get into the word of God. You wanna have your mind clear from earthly things? Well, read eternal things, not just earthly things. So King Josiah started reading scripture. The Holy Spirit fills him. And what did he do as a righteous leader? He gathers the entire nation of Israel and line by line reads the Bible in front of them. And what we see is that he, through scripture, personally repents of his sin and his repentance leads to the entire nation repenting. And so what do you see the kingdom of of Israel doing? It's an outpouring of God's spirit. We call that these days a revival in the nation of Israel. This is what happens when a righteous leader is in, in charge, when he a surrendered, humble heart, gets in the word of God and lives out what he reads. You see the nation coming together in revival, respect and surrender to the Lord. That's a religious leader. And I'm sure just like me, that's who you would want leading our nation. Am I correct? Okay, but he's not on the ballot. This year he's not. Maybe in the future, but right now, a leader like King Josiah, whether it's Kamala or Trump, they are not King Josiah's, okay? Sorry if that offends you. It's the truth. So here's the second kind of leader. And I'm not saying either one of them are this leader either. But the second kind of leader we see in Scripture is the complete opposite of Josiah. You got religious leaders, but also you got r- wicked leaders. And in the Old Testament, you see specifically two who were the, considered the most wicked leaders of all of Israel. It's Ahab and Jezebel. And they are leaders who were unrighteous people because they promoted themselves over the Lord. And what happened is they drew the nation or allowed the nation to fall into idolatry rather than the word of God. They persecuted prophets of the Lord. They murdered innocent people of the nation of Israel and stole from them. And so what you see is when leaders like Ahab and Jezebel are in charge, the cities of that nation are filled with lawlessness, theft, murder, and chaos. And just for a second, look across our nation. And let me just ask you, does that sound familiar? You know why? Because the word of God is not in the White House. That is why it is important for us to use 
our God-given wisdom through the Holy Spirit to make our vote count towards things that more align with Scripture. I think over the past few years, we have had a leader that maybe not be wicked in the form of persecuting or pain or putting people in prison for their faith, but we do have a leader who is wicked in the area of tolerance of sin in promotion of things that go against scripture. And that is why you see a downfall in our nation over the areas of life, uh, sexual preference, or the truth of what marriage is supposed to look like. And you see people who are confused doing irrational things to their bodies because no one is stepping in and speaking truth to them. They're tolerating it and more, even more so, they're celebrating it. That is where we, as believers, have to take a stance. And in politics, our voice doesn't come from picket signs on the side of the road. Can I just be honest with you? That does nothing. Your vote is what speaks. So vote towards someone, and I'm gonna get into the policies here as I close, but vote for someone who goes, uh, who goes with scripture rather than promotes and celebrates sin. Now, those are two extremes. You have righteous leaders and you have wicked leaders. And again, I'm not saying those that are running for office right now fall into either of those categories. To be real with you, I think we have more of the third type of leader. Uh, maybe there's others that go more in line with the second, but I think to look at it this way objectively, we have the third type of leader. And the third type of leader we see in scripture is flawed people, but are still used to do some good things. King Jehu in 2 Kings 9 is an example of this kind of leader. We'll read, you can read that he was a very flawed man and even led or allowed the nation of Israel to worship idols, fall into a, a idol worship. Some believe that this man was not a true follower of God. However, he still wasn't completely wicked and so he allowed the Lord to use him for some good for the nation of Israel. One of the things he did is he executed judgment on Ahab and Jezebel and he got them out of power. He also destroyed all of the altars of Baal, the false God that they were worshiping. So even though he might not have been completely in line with the God that we serve, he still did some good things for the nation of Israel. So my point in all of this with these three types of leaders is we don't have a Josiah. And so when you look at it this way and you don't have that option and your choice is between Ahab and Jezebel or Jehu, the choice is very obvious because a flawed leader can still be used to do good things. And it's better to have him in charge than have someone that we suffer under because they're wicked. So going back to the question, should you as a believer vote? Absolutely you should. And my kind of final point on this is using the words of Christ uh, because he called us as his disciples. He says, you're the salt of the earth. And yes, he's speaking towards spiritual things, but again, when politics come into spiritual things, then what we're supposed to do is also use our spiritual authority over things like politics. And so when Jesus says we're the salt of the earth, what he is saying is as salt, the, the way it was used, you probably know this, the way salt was used was a preservative with its purpose to slow decay. And so one way we use our God-given right to influence the nation with righteousness is to vote. And in that process, it could slow the decay of our nation. Y'all following? So when we choose who to vote for, understand we might not have someone who embodies all of our views, but we can look at both sets of policies and see which set is more likely to slow the decay of our society. Now, with all that, let me start to close this out. And I want to, this is where it might get a little controversial. And you know what? I might be going too far into the political sphere, if you will, but I'm already there, right? So it is what it is. <laughs> There's, um, I wanna look at four main policies that we see that are, that are different in both of these areas. Okay, and again, I want to look up these object, objectively, you know what I'm saying, but also respectfully. And I just want to say, okay, let's look at scripture and allow scripture to persuade us or influence us to vote a particular way according to scripture, not opinion, right? Who, whose authority is greater than your authority? The God, right? Can we say God, everybody? Okay, so let's look at scripture then. Number one, these are the main ones that I see that we deal with. It's number one, border security. So let me say, 
in dealing with the policies that we see in border security, I first wanna say, as Christians, we are called to love immigrants. That is a biblical command. Y'all follow me? Loving our neighbor and providing for someone in need is a biblical command. I wanna, there's multiple verses on this, but let me give you two uh, just to kind of clarify these. Number one is Zechariah 7.10. And again, they use kind of the same language here because these are both prophets of the Lord. So the Lord doesn't change what he says between person to person. What he says is true. And so two prophets say close to the same thing. It says this, do not oppress, number one, the widow, the fatherless, who is the orphan, or the foreigner, foreigner, which is an immigrant, or the poor, and do not plot evil against evil. So there you go. Number one, do not oppress the widow, the orphan, or the fatherless, um, the fo- foreigner, or the poor. Jeremiah backs this up in seven, five through seven. I'm gonna have a different version. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood on this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then what? then I will let you live in this place in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. If you do these things, essentially he's saying, I will bless your land. We are called to provide for those in need and that includes immigrants or foreigners. We should as Christians welcome them. However, there's a right way for someone to come into our country in a wrong way. Let me dial it back and let me just say, clap objectively, not just for your opinion. We are called to love those who come from other places, but we also have laws that were put in place to protect our nation from harm and secure our borders. And this is also a biblical principle. The Bible agrees with borders separating countries. Number one, we see God himself separated an entire nation, sent them to multiple lands because when they all got together, they rebelled against God and thought they were more powerful than God. You can see this in Genesis 11 in the Tower of Babel. So number one, you know why we are separated as nations? Because God did it. Because he wanted people to be separate and have borders. But if that's not clear enough, let's go to the book we're studying, Acts 17. Now again, this is within a, passage, but the verse speaks for itself. And he says, and he made from one man, every nation out of God, out of Christ, made one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Now look, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. So should we allow immigrants who come legally? Absolutely. Should we apologize for having a secure border border with a process to enter our country? Absolutely not. When voting for the policy of border security, the question we should ask is which candidate will best protect our national security while also allowing people to enter lawfully? Number two, these might go a little faster. The policy of religious liberties. We are getting to a place that, matter of fact, we're there in a lot of circumstances where the government has stepped in and it has forced people to do something because they refuse because of their religious beliefs. And again, this was a quote from another pastor, but I, you can see it, you can look it up. But there have been bakers, cake makers, cupcake makers, whatever, bakers, graphic designers, photographers, who would not provide their services because it was in celebrations of marriages that go against scripture gay marriages. And so they said, we don't want to provide that because if we provide this, we're supporting sin. And so what you have seen because of that, the government has stepped in and their refusal to do that resulted in a loss of their job, their business, or even their funding. You've even seen teachers who were fired, number one, because they didn't take a vaccine. I'm not getting into that. I know that's controversial. But number two, you've seen teachers fired because they have refused to use a different pronoun over someone because they said, I'm now a different gender. So teachers, because they're not falling into that nonsense, were fired from their occupation because government stepped in and said, you have to do it. So we have to step in and use our vote rightly 
to make sure that our religious liberties stay true. And let me just warn you, the book of Revelation, just as a warning, because it's prophetic, the book of Revelation says this issue of religious freedom is only going to get worse. That's why we're going to see, the book of Revelation points out a one world government. And if you don't follow what they say, you're gonna be put to death, starved, and you're gonna take your house and everything from you. So this is a principle that's only going to get worse. That's why you gotta understand eternal perspective. Stand true on the word of God. Don't fall into the trap of sin and and blaspheme against God because your stuff is more important than your eternal life. Again, religious liberties are going to get worse. Expect it. Trust in the Lord for he is sovereign. And like I said in the beginning, he will come reign for a thousand years. And after that, we'll be in the clean kingdom of God for all of eternity with a perfect righteous leader. So with that, number two, religious liberties, ask the question when you go to vote, which candidate is more likely to protect what you stand for and what the word of God stands for? Number three, biological sex. Genesis 1.27, let me make this very clear. Genesis 1.27, when you put that up, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Three times he says he created him. Who did he create them? Male and female, he created them. Very clear. We do not, how do I say this? Well, I'll say it flat out. We do not get to choose who we marry in the form of the opposite sex or same sex, nor do we get to choose what our gender is. The Lord has defined who we are and who we are to marry all the way back in the very first book of scripture. God created man in his image. He created them male and female, and he created them both to come into relationship with, and that relationship, male and female, is what God ordained to honor him through marriage. I wanna get that across. However, I wanna say this. There is no however to that, so erase that however. I do wanna say this, though. Y'all like, "Uh uh-oh, no. No, I I wanna speak with grace and truth on this issue, because yes, that's what the Word of God says, But the word of God also says he has grace, compassion, and love for anyone who is living in sin, whether it's dealing with these issues, addictions, uh, marital problems, or uh, or adultery, or whatever it may be. God has grace, and he offers redemption for anybody in sin. So if you are someone that is in a same-sex homosexual relationship, or if you're someone who identifies as transgender, or if you have somebody in your family that currently is in those situations, I want you to know this first off. God loves you and so do we at New River Church. I'm not done, hold on. I want you to also know that you are welcome in this place and you will never be pushed away nor judged. Know that. We love you and so does God. However, we will stand on the word of God and it is very clear that we do not get to choose to marry someone of the same sex, nor do we get to choose our gender. We love you, we honor you, we will help you and not judge you, but we will honor the Lord over your opinions and what you think is right. The Lord calls you to be born again. Sorry, and when you're born again, you come into the kingdom of God and he redefines your heart and your mind. He redefines who you are. I just wanna make that clear. This is why this topic is such a big deal. It goes so much further than just, you can't tell me who I, who I marry or you can't tell me who I wanna be. It's so much further than this. And this is why Satan is so tricky. He knows that if he can get people to marry the same sex or get people to change their gender, it doesn't just change the demographic of our nation, but it completely erodes the institution of a family. God put the family structure together for a purpose. And when we start to redefine what a family is, that's when the nation, that's when people start to break down and fall away from the living God. That is why it is so important to support the transgender or homosexual movement is literally to rebel against God's created order that he set in place. So when we ask ourselves, When we vote, we need to ask ourselves, which candidate will oppose transgender and homosexual ideology and protect the God-given order of the family? Answer that question for yourself when you go to the ballot box. Now, last one, the topic of abortion. Before I say anything, I wanna say the same thing I said for those who might be dealing with these the sin of same-sex marriage or transgender. I wanna say this, if you're 
one of the one, listen to these numbers, one in four women in our nation who have had an abortion or terminated pregnancy, I want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you and so do we. Please understand this fact. The death that most defines your life is not the death of your unborn child. It is the sin cleansing death of Jesus Christ. But I also have to say the truth of the word. And in John 10, 10, it says this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I, Jesus, have come that, I, that they, they may have life and have it abundantly. The Bible calls God the author of life. God himself is life. The only reason you have breath in your lungs and a beating of your heart is because the breath of God was breathed into your lungs. His life is transferred to you. So to think that we can determine whether a child gets to see the light of day or not is absurd. Absurd. And let me take it a step further. And I wanna be careful because again, if you've fallen into that trap of the one in four ladies, I'm not saying this for you, but I'm saying that there is one party that I see right now, political party, that is using abortion to manipulate you to vote for them. But what you're seeing, it's not just women with the freedom to terminate a pregnancy. Can I be real with you? Spiritually, this is satanic worship at its finest. It is. Let me just point this out. And I know I'm gonna give away my stance, but it is what it is. When you have at the, here we go, at the Democratic National Convention, you roll up trucks like taco trucks for women to have abortions and then go in and celebrate that, that is satanic and demonic. I'm just being honest with you. That is completely against what God says. He says, I came to give life and have it abundantly. Not, I came so you can determine if this child lives or not. Let me be objective. There is no candidate on our ballots that is 100% pro-life, none. Trump now has even said that he would uh, sign or allow some states to give abortions within the first 15 weeks. Did you know that 90% of abortions are in the first, first 15 weeks? So, and I, again, this, this was a pastor saying this and I agree 100%. What we have seen, and this is the slow decay of our nation, is the Republican party is the Democratic party about 20 years ago. Because we had a Democratic leader, John F. Kennedy in charge that said, oh, I'm sorry, Bill Clinton in charge that says, I want abortions to be Fair, legal, and rare. Tell me that's not what we're now seeing in the Republican Party. There is no candidate who is pro-life, but I will say this, one is clearly better than the other. That's the way America goes. This is when sin infiltrates a nation. They lead you a little bit further to depravity and they mask it as something good. I'll just be real too. Trump is also trying to manipulate people to vote to say, oh, well, I'll, I'll let abortions happen, but only at this period of time. That's manipulation. But again, one side is clearly better than the other in my opinion. Last thing I wanna say. All right, this is now back to us as Christians. Let's dial it back. Let's put it in the 10,000 square foot view. Last thing I wanna say for us as Christians, those who represent Jesus. This is now on individual level with relationships. Please don't let your political opinion hurt an eternal relationship. And I'm not talking between you and the Lord. It is not worth losing your witness for Jesus Christ because you want your political opinion to be known. And let me just say this. I received your emails. I saw your comments. I'm not preaching this message because you wanted me to. I don't go for man's approval. I go for the Lord's approval. I'm preaching this message because I feel that the Holy Spirit is trying to re- it's changed the mentality of our nation to say we as Christians have a purpose in the political area and it's to move people more towards godly things. So please don't allow your political opinion or your desire to be heard ruin your witness for Jesus Christ. 
Here's the truth as I wrap up. As important as, elect, as an election is, I am not minimizing how important it is to put the right person in charge of our country. However, I'll say this though, it is still an earthly issue. We just sang, our God reigns for all of eternity. What we're dealing with in politics is an earthly issue. Don't ruin a relationship that the Lord may have given you to teach the gospel for an earthly issue that will only last for a couple hundred years or so. Yes, policies last for a long time, but the kingdom of God lasts for way longer. So don't rob that person that you have the opportunity to witness to, don't rob them of eternity, amen? Here's the truth, there are things that politics can fix, but there's also things politics cannot fix and they cannot fix what it did not break. And you cannot solve a spiritual problem with a political solution. The world's greatest problem is not political, it is spiritual. It is a sin problem and sin problems require a savior solution. But let me tell you, there's good news because we have one in the person of Jesus Christ. But you are called, your purpose, as we said last week, is to reflect the heart and character of Jesus Christ. You are primarily a citizen of heaven. You are secondarily a resident of this nation. That is the most important thing for you to remember. And I know you might not like hearing everything that I'm saying, and especially this. Some of you are capital R Republicans and lower C Christians. Some of you are capital D Democrats and your lowercase c Christians. So let me just remind you, Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, and that ultimately is the only thing that matters in eternity. I'm done, can we pray? <laughs> Here's how I like to close this as you bow your heads and, and posture your hearts to the Lord. I want us to be reminded of that last thing I just said. That yes, politics and elections are important for us, but the most important thing is that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. So we're gonna sing this song that proclaims that truth that he is on his throne, he is reigning. He has thousands of angels worshiping him right this second. He is the most important thing in your life. And you understanding the order of God first is what you need to focus on in this moment. So as we sing this song, would you worship Christ like you mean it? Would you put God on his rightful place, the throne of your heart? And with all that being said, I wanna pray that God pours out reformation and revival on our nation. I wanna pray, Lord Jesus, that you come, that the Holy Spirit comes down to this place, that we, as your children, can continue to live out your glory, your mission, your purposes, and it all be for your good, for your glory. May you, Lord Jesus, claim all things you, you claim in your word, you make all things new. So for those in this place that are struggling with the way the nation is right now, will you remind us that you reign and you're on your throne and you say you will make all things new. For those who have come this morning not expecting what was just taught, would you soften their hearts to understand that we are a church that wants to honor and glorify Christ above all things. May you allow them, Lord Jesus, allow all of us to just now fall at your feet and put you in your rightful place in our hearts. We thank you, God, that you have allowed us to live in this great nation and country. And although sometimes we don't agree what's going on, we are still blessed and we thank you for allowing that, Father God. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us a voice, a voice to speak truth to this world, truth through this political ideas and arena. And so, Father God, I pray that as we go to these election sites, these polling venues, Lord, will you allow us through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to honor you with who we choose to be the leader. And I pray for whoever it is, whether it is Donald Trump or Kamala Harris, may they come to know you as Lord and Savior. May we see them fall in line like King Josiah and honor you, respect you, and humbly come before you as King and Lord. May we see that. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with me and worship our King and Savior, Jesus?